us what's up how you doing it's me analog attack nice to see you i'm really excited tonight because i've got someone in the same time zone as me we've got david hopkins how you doing david hello all the Hi, way mike all the way from nara there that's where i am right i'm in osaka we're pretty near i guess and what are you drinking tonight david i'm having uh a few glasses of green hawk green hawk which is a sake yeah what does that mean in the english that you speak <laughs> <laughs> well um it's not something you normally would want to drink <laughs> <laughs> okay is it is it tasty is it one of your favorites yeah it's it's uh, it's very dry yeah uh, it's my first time to drink this one oh wow. it's 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 very dry and you drink it chilled and uh, I'm switching over with the season from drinking sake hot to drinking it chilled and there you go it's nice great I'm people are sick to death of this but the usual Ginga Kogan, Ginga Kogan. Yeah. classic if I may say so especially in this weather anyway David, enough, about beer. Right? enough about beer enough about yeah. okay let's get to the music we've got so much to talk about I've got all right so many things I want to ask you about. So for you, like when did your journey with like a relationship with Japanese music begin? Do you remember? Um, all right. So the, the first five or six years are not going to really count towards what okay. later is really important. But uh, I came to Japan in 1979. Wow. And uh I was already 25 years old, right. so I'm I'm 67 years old now, I'm an old look, man. It's gonna, I'm gonna amazing. like Christopher Lloyd and Back to the Future. <laughs> you look great. And um, and I was of course a music fan all my life and a record collector and uh, very much a record guy. Right. And uh, of course, you know that was 1979, so you know punk and new wave had had happened, were happening, and so on. And when I came here, of course, I was interested in what's Japanese punk and, and new wave. And yeah. um, the surprise was that there there wasn't very much. Right. And uh, if, I, if I start digging in here, I can probably find cool. like the first Anarchy record wow. and, uh, yeah. and, Sheena, and the Ro Sheena and the Rockets yeah. and uh, the Plastics. And here's, here's one. Pikachu. Oh. Uh, bought in real time in 1979 or 1980. And, but the major labels in Japan weren't really interested in doing something so that their idea was a techno pop. Right. And even Hikashu actually were a, a pretty, pretty good rocking band live. Yeah. But these, these records are all this twitchy, tinkly uh, synthesizer stuff. Yeah. And, uh, um exaggerated squeaky vocals and uh yeah um i i would argue that the, this is a an effort by um japanese record industry to keep kids away from punk could be uh yeah but anyway so that's so that's that's what i found and but like i said i was a record guy so i didn't go out to uh, shows very much i grew up in i grew up in i grew up in pittsburgh yeah which is kind of like kind of like growing up in Leeds or Sheffield or something like that. And, That's a, mm, um, so, yeah, it's an industrial city yeah. and very working class ethic, and we got good concerts, but not that many. Right. And uh, and I went to college in a small town where they didn't get that many good shows, mm. and uh, so so it wasn't so much, and they, and there weren't good live clubs. Right. With live music, so. When I came to Japan, I was a record guy, and I didn't really think about live music that much, ex except when you pay, you know, twenty dollars to go to a concert hall and sit mm -hmm. in a seat that has a number on it, and watch the the band. Right. And uh, so, um, that's I, that was my music culture: records and uh, that kind of uh, concert. Right. But I I found this record store. There were good record stores, especially in Kyoto. Mm -hmm. And Jujia, which is a, basically a musical instruments store, mm -hmm. had at that time uh, imported record section. Right. And there was this little guy <laughs> who was the manager of the shop, <laughs> about, about, five, about five feet, two inches tall, 
and uh, and I was going to the shop regularly, and he st so we started to be friends, and he would recommend records, and they had one bin of uh, Japanese indies. Okay. And it, well, I'm, I'm really talking about one bin, so like 30, 40 records right. were in the bin. And he started to recommend records to me. And that was the, the game changer. Wow. And his name was uh, Hirokawa Shin. Mm. And, and he later had the label Zero Records. Okay. Which put out records by Shonen Knife mm. and uh, Suyama Kumiko and a few other people. It wasn't a punk label per se. Right. And so after I started, to, after everything he recommended to me was good. Yeah. So I, so I trusted him, and I started to pick up flyers. I didn't I didn't read Japanese very well yet. Right. Although I've worked on it really hard since then. Good boy, good boy. <laughs> uh, and I, I went to a couple of uh, punk festivals. Punk festivals? In, again in Kyoto. At uh, Kyoto Seibu Kodo. Right. On the, the west end of uh, Kyoto's campus. Yes. University's campus. Mm. And there I saw some bands that later become quite famous. Oh, Scarlet! Oh, I can't even guess actually. Like Con Continental Kids and oh. uh, um, Lip Great Cream and, uh, and, and uh, people like that. When did you see Lip Cream, David? Do you remember the year? I'm 80. guessing 80, 83. Oh wow, that that must have been incredible. I'm, yeah. Well, but the the shows were so uneven. Mm -hmm. So there were there was there were like forty minute sets. Right with like eight eight bands or something yeah. like that and three of them would would be really great and four of them would be really shit right and one and one of them might be interesting but need needing to practice more or something mm -hmm. like that mm -hmm. so it, it really wasn't a very exciting this is this is what i want to do with my free time kind of experience gotcha yeah. right mm. and uh i I did never. I never had a chance in those days to see Shonen Knife live because they didn't mm. play out very much yet. Right. So, um, so I was teaching at a university already. I started teaching at a university in '79, and after six years, yep. um, it it had gotten quite boring, and nothing was ever changing. And uh, I asked the university, "Can I teach?" Um, Com composition, English composition, mm. in addition to conversation. Right. And they said, no, you're a foreigner and you you teach speaking classes and that's it. And so I said, okay, well, thank you very much for the last six years. And uh, and I went back to the US. Okay. And uh, they hired somebody else and he did it for a year and a half and suddenly quit. And uh, so they contacted me, and of course, this is the middle of a school year. It's difficult right. to find somebody. Yeah. So if you come, if you come back, <laughs> we'll get, we'll give you a, con a composition class and a seminar. Wow! So you came all the way back from Pittsburgh. I wasn't in Pittsburgh. I was yeah. in Wisconsin. All right. That okay. time. Ah, okay. That's right. that's where my that's where my lady friend was. Right. And uh, th this is important because okay. Wisconsin is a major university with 20,000 students, which means they have a fantastic live club scene. Mm -hmm. So my year and a half in Wisconsin mm -hmm. converted me from a record guy to a live guy. Okay, okay. So when I came back mm -hmm. in late, in the fall of 86, I set out to find the, the clubs. So we're talking Osaka, Kyoto. Os Osaka, Kyoto. Yeah. Osaka, Kyoto. And what did yeah. you find, David? Well, again, I, I could read a little better by this time. So I could okay. uh, I could see the flyers in the record stores and so on. And there was a club in Umeda called Bourbon House. Bourbon House. Well, I've never heard of that. Yeah. And oh. I I... I saw the Blue Hearts play there twice. Damn! What kind of is it? What kind of size is it? Small place. Two hundred people. Two hundred people. 
Um, yeah. And there were a bunch of other other bands there, yeah. but I it was, you know, it was it kind of guessing what looked good. Mm. And around that time, I started to pick up the magazine called Fool's Mate. I know it. Yeah. Yeah. And Fool's Mate was very much a Tokyo oriented right. magazine. So you could read about what the cool bands in Tokyo were, but it wouldn't tell you anything about what was going on in right, Osaka. Right. And but because of that, I found out about eggplants and Fandango. Uh, there's a place in Kyoto called Donzoko House. Donzoko, yeah. Uh, Takutaku Taku. in Kyoto is still there. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 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 Um, I think there was a place called Circus Circus in right. Higash Higashiyama in Kyoto. Oh. So, so that the the articles that were featured were almost all uh, Tokyo bands, mm. but they introduced me because those Tokyo bands, if they if they played in Kansai, they played at those clubs. Right. So I would go to those clubs and I get the schedule from the club, and that's sort of where it, it took off. And the amazing thing was, I was still thinking that you know the cool music is punk and new wave, and and of course we're well into post punk by this time. Right. And I was shocked to discover that in, in Osaka, there was a whole different thing going on oh, yeah? <laughs> that nobody else knew about. Uh, but but just, and this of, one, just for me and some of the people that like watch this like channel, what they've heard you say eggplant. So we want to hear a little bit about some of the, maybe the hardcore punk bands that you saw eggplant back in the mid eighties or. Um, yeah, so this would be 86, 86. and on. So the uh, eggplant was, I think it was, the building was originally a warehouse okay. for um, um, toilets and sinks and uh, bathtubs. And, right. and it had been remodeled. They still had toilets stored upstairs oh, there. Wow. But it, it, it had been remodeled into... Uh, um, music uh, rehearsal studios okay and i think you would go into the entrance this was in hanazono cho in south osaka mm. a, a bit a bit of a rough area but yeah you know it's it's japan it's not not really dangerous yeah but by japanese and, band, it's kind of considered one of the most dangerous areas in japan, pretty much yeah but yeah. but i i never had a bad experience there and uh, so you would go in and there's yeah. a lobby and in the lobby, there's a beer machine. And uh, at the back of the lobby, there's a, a hall with, again, soundproof doors, so it mm. could be used as a rehearsal studio. Right. And that would hold two, 300 people. And sometimes they would jam in maybe 400 people for a popular show. Right. And to the right, to the right mm. side, going in the back, there were three rehearsal studios that were much smaller, oh, wow. again, with sound, soundproof doors. Mm. And uh, it stayed open all night so that uh, people were there practicing. Mm -hmm. And I, I saw such good shows there right away that I rented a room nearby. <laughs> Did you rent? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I could go, so I could go every night. <laughs> uh, it just, it's such a legendary <laughs> venue, you know, for people in to, especially I would say my hardcore punk is only one of the kinds of music they have there, but it's so legendary for people into the Japanese music from that era you know well and this this is also alchemy records had gotten started up at that time and their connection was uh, symbiotic just to, to say the least okay and and just like alchemy records uh, uh eggplant basically had three types of music that they played okay and one is is punk and hardcore right and one is experimental and noise yeah and one is uh, what what we called psyche psychedelic, and psyche, psyche were people who still playing sixties rock mm. into the eighties, basically, and it's not not really progressive. They weren't they weren't that good on their instruments, mm. and and it wasn't it wasn't really keyboard oriented. Right. But um, so this uh, psychedelic guitar rock and uh, hardcore and um, noise that's funny because and, that's the kind of records that alchemy would put out too right kind of yeah 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 yes exactly mm. the the three different the three, three different. different strands yeah. 
uh, were were both uh, reflected in both places. Yeah. yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, and but the thing is that uh, at eggplant you could actually get <laughs> all three in one night. <laughs> right, right. Let, let's sort of name some names. When I think of hardcore, I'm thinking of Alto, was one of the all-time great bands from Osaka, right? Oto. Oto. Yeah. What does that mean? It means to Oto. throw up, to be sick, to puke, right? Yeah, it means vo vomit. Vomit. Yeah. Vomit. Yeah. Vomit. Yeah. And the it, there were many, many times a double bill of SOB and Oto. Yes. Halfwit Live. And and those those attracted a lot of people, wow. so it was quite crowded. Mm. And uh, the stage at uh, at on the biggest hall in uh, Eggplant mm. was only about fifty centimeters, so there wasn't really stage diving or crowd wow. surfing or anything like that. And in fact, uh, in the early days, people would really avoid the person who tried to get up and 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 you can see them hit the floor pretty hard sometimes right. so, so but uh yeah what i remember most is sob and oto shows yeah well yeah and how about dance macabre did you ever see them dance macabre nightmare oh yeah uh cobra yeah they're uh, sure and those and the rapes right they have the quite rapes. the reputation even to this day <laughs> but uh yeah the amazing the amazing thing was that the the dance macabre and nightmare and rapes guys were often sitting around the lobby uh, drinking oh, yeah. and they were and and uh, so i'm i'm a, a white guy <laughs> and um i have a real job <laughs> and uh, a normal kind of person but they were, they were, I wouldn't say that they were, were exceedingly friendly toward me, mm. but they were never, never rough or scary or, well, in or anything. Case, and I, and I, yeah, go ahead, Dave. go ahead. Yeah, I, I still have a connection with a cherry from. Uh, I'm wearing uh, like the SHI. Yeah. Yeah. They've, she, got, they've got a new album coming out. And when he said Pittsburgh, I remember Cherry lived in Pittsburgh at one yes. point, right? Yes, right. and we had that connection, yes. right? That's what I when you so, said Pittsburgh, yeah, I, 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 yeah that's interesting. Yeah. Well, I was gonna say to him, but when you mentioned Nightmare, actually meeting those guys really opened up the doors for me in Kansai for me personally. They were really friendly, welcomed me, and from when I after meeting them, they kind of opened the door for me, and everyone accepted me in the kind of Japanese hardcore scene, really, yeah. Well, really, uh, I Again, you know, I, I could speak Japanese pretty well by this mm. time. Yeah. Although maybe not the kind of Japanese that they talk to each other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, they were quite uh, tolerant anyway. Yeah. And uh, and I was, after all, supporting them and buying tickets to all their shows. So right. I was never asking anybody to let me in free or anything like that. So, And I eventually started to buy their records and so on, too. So. And Shonen Knife did play at Eggplant. Okay, really? Wow. Yeah, so I can, I can have, there we got uh, the first Shonen Knife record. Wow. Burning, Burning Farm. Farm. Burning Farm, yeah. It's an eight inch record. Hard. This is yeah. the yellow jacket, wow. the yellow jacket there. There's also a black jacket, so. and uh, Yamanoacha. Wow. Nice. And I, and I really liked the Shonen Knife a lot, and they were, of course, very cute and very friendly. And uh, I, and I think they were maybe already getting a little bit of attention. Mm. I think uh, Cal Calvin from K Records and. Okay had uh, been to Japan and had picked up, you know, I also have a box of cassettes here. Oh. Um, <laughs> all right, so this, this bag, this oh, bag right here. I look, Tim, I look special. This is the very first Shonen Knife cassette. Cool. First demo? One of first the, cassette, yeah. First ever. 
Wow. There are there were 50 of these made. And last year, one of these sold on Yahoo auctions for 150,000 yen. Damn. You got that direct from the band at a show? Yes. Yeah. And I have two. Yeah, you're not going to sell those though, right? No, never. Never. And this one, this one still has a kiss mark you can see. <laughs> what? You can see it. You can see it. <laughs> and this one, this one, if it if it ever had a kiss mark, it's faded away now. So, <laughs> all right. So this is this is an edition of fifty. Yeah. And uh, so I I I have four percent of the of those, <laughs> and uh, mm. they reprinted another thirty five copies with a different okay you have card. A, okay. Uh, so I have three percent of those. So. Wow. David, I kind of derailed um, you a little bit, bit about with my, because I'm kind of obsessed with the hardcore punk, but you were saying that there was other stuff going on too. I know like uh, you probably want to talk about that, not the hardcore punk stuff, but a little bit more about the experimental stuff. Well, well it, there, um, Eggplant also had a connection mm -hmm. with a lot of students from Osaka University of the Arts. Okay. And uh, so there were free jazz groups and experimental groups and uh, homemade instrument groups. Mm. There was a, a group called the Osaka Power Shovel Arts Association. And uh, they were machines and screaming saxophones, basically. Cool. And, and uh, actually, when I was a teenager, mm. I, list I started to listen to jazz. And I mm. listened to jazz through college. but I listen to like um, ECM kind of jazz. Right. Yeah, yeah, I've been get, I've been getting into a bit of that too, actually, recently. Yeah, yeah. yeah but so the 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 whole screaming sax thing was not something that had been in my experience. Right. Uh, so uh, the really aggressive, uh, the punk of jazz kind of yeah, kind yeah. of thing, and the, and you can see that at eggplant too. Right. And I saw and I saw Hijo Kaidan for the first Ooh. time there. Here's uh, the very first Hijo Kaidan record. Damn. And it's it's got Second Damascus. Yeah, that's what? that's the real title of this. So, mm. so if you if you look at the picture, it says Zoroku no Kibyo. Mm. I can't get there. There we go. Yep, got it. Yep. Yeah, so most people think the album title is Zoro Kuno Kibyo, but that's wrong. It's the, the title of the picture is Zoro Kuno Kibyo. Right. And, um, and although, you know, I found that the pure noise, I, 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 wasn't, I wasn't aware of Hana Tarashi while Hana Tarashi existed. Okay. So I found out about Hana Tarashi afterwards. Of course, the Hana Tarashi records mm. were alchemy, alchemy records, but right. um, and this is this is a special scoop for your program <laughs> that yeah. the, all the guitar noise on the Hana Tarashi records is played by Jojo Hiroshige. Okay. Not by Yamatsuka. Wow. Yeah. And this is why they've never been reissued. It's not right. Be because Yamatsuka won't admit that. Ooh. <laughs> big big, big scoop here. Wow. <laughs> That's cool. Um. But I, I, I can't say that I was really impressed by noise at first. I, could, okay. I was impressed by the power. Okay. Mm. But I didn't have a, a way to understand it. Right in those days so david bar noise what did, did you ever go there you used to go there a lot no, i didn't i didn't i didn't go there okay that's another kind of old sucker place that i've heard a lot of stories about never went myself but uh, uh. well <laughs> i i think i have developed years for listening to noise all right and I can I can appreciate noise and mm. and good live noise is mm. is still really interesting. In fact, before the pandemic, the last show I went to was a Hijo Kaidan show. Was it really? Where was that? Bears? Yeah. At Bears, Bears about a year ago, about almost exactly a year ago from wow. now. Wow. 
Um, mm. So back to eggplant yeah, uh, and yeah, Secudi. Yeah, Secu yeah. Secudi would play there. Mm. Yeah. And and I got to be good friends with Secudi. Mm. And uh, again, they were an alchemy alchemy yeah. band, and everybody was taking care of these girls so that the uh, the punk guys wouldn't hit on them too much. And and uh, they were they were friendly and cute, and they they talked kind of dirty. <laughs> <laughs> at least in this at least at least in the songs yes yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh and uh so actually mixed bills with secudi and other hardcore groups cool. and they couldn't play their instruments hardly at all right so right. it was it was good the original bass player of secudi was probably the only one who was close to being a juvenile delinquent oh and the other three were sort of pretending to be juvenile delinquents yeah. And unfortunately, and so the, unfortunately, the the bass player wrote all the songs, mm. and the singer wrote all the lyrics. And because she was actually close to being a juvenile delinquent, she got pregnant when she was about nineteen or twenty. Okay. And and left the band. Right. And so after after the first couple of records, they don't have anybody to write songs. Uh so that uh, there's the quality went went down pretty fast did, did you did you bring them to the states yes i did and there's a story It'll about be... okay tell it i think you probably know what i'm going to ask you about the you were in the newspaper right is that right you were, you, there's a, yeah. you were in the newspaper article with yeah. a studio in madison and nirvana there's a nirvana connection somewhere too is it it's a butch vig's smart butch... studios okay because I had been in Madison mm. and I still had the friend in Madison who could set this up. So we organized a chance for them to record at right. Smart Studios, not with Butch, mm. although he did show up, he did show up to hear what was going on. Wow. But by this time they didn't have any good songs. So they weren't very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you put out they, uh, we, we, the EP, they put out, that was, the EP was the first EP that the security the very first public very public first bath uh, right. EP. right and uh, so public bath got started as a way for me to well I, I was hearing all this great music right and uh and nobody was paying attention mm. and there was because of groups like sandy and the sunsets mm. and the plastics the British press, Melody Maker and NME, mm. were starting starting to be interested in Japanese new wave. Right. But that wasn't, as far as I could tell, the interesting music in Japan. Mm. So I th I didn't have any money. Mm. So if you look at Public Bath Seven Inch Records, they're all really cheaply produced. Did you press but, them? Um, you pressed them in the states at that time. In the states, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was an it was an American company for, it's much too complicated to start a new uh, label in Japan at that right. time. Right, right. So um, the whole purpose of it was to introduce this, especially Osaka music mm. to a wider audience. Right. Um, maybe this meant an American audience. I, mm. I, don't, I, don't think we, I don't think we cared about that, but right. um, that's where I had a connection, so. Yeah. And the first uh, several releases were all licensed from Alchemy Records. Yes, yeah. Because I was friends with them and uh, and they would let me license them for free, basically. So I there was a, in 1987, I think there was a, <clears throat> an Alchemy Bowling Tournament. <laughs> what? <laughs> Jesus. And a bunch, a bunch of... <laughs> A bunch like of Mitchell, a bunch of Harry. <laughs> there, yes, yes. <laughs> and, <laughs> and uh, and uh, they took over a bowling alley about four lanes or so on and have different different teams uh, set up bowling. And because I was hanging out at mm. uh, eggplant every night, I got in, I got invited. Do you want to come? Wow. And that was the first time I really talked to Jojo Hiroshige for okay. a long time. Right. And he was a terrible bowler. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I just I'm just trying to picture the scene. Yeah. But they, but they had a record store too, right? Did they have the record store at that time, Alchemy? In Osaka? Not yet. Oh, not yet. Not yet. Okay. No. All right. Uh, actually, Jojo had was. I don't know whether this counts as a job or not, but he had uh, a used record store, mm. and and also renting bootleg concert videos. Wow. And actually, and historically, the the I'm not sure where he made the connection, but he had a huge collection of bootleg concert videos mm. of of British and American bands, basically. Wow. And that was a good source of income for him in the early days of alchemy. I see. So, What's the name of that store, David? Do you remember? I could tell you where it is. Where, oh, <laughs> go on, then that'll do. What, like, is it, it's, missionaries? It's in, I mean, it was in America Mura. Oh, really? Okay. But in, in the north edge of America Mura, uh -huh. and there's a, a small shop, and mm -hmm. And the only people who came in there were people who nobody came in to buy used records. They came in to rent White Snake videos and uh, <laughs> wow. um, whatever yeah. bootlegs. Wow. So completely illegal, actually, mm, mm, from mm, a copyright mm. standpoint. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's amazing. And the amazing thing is, because it's Japan, people would actually return the videos <laughs> after they watched them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Even when I came here, I, I used to kind of rent records out they, that, that was a thing too right the rental record yeah uh, that was cool rent the record tape it take it back <laughs> and they had some quite rare records actually yeah. you know like some of the old hardcore yeah. punk records he said just take them home and yeah. tape them what were they thinking <laughs> I know. It's, uh, it's a cool idea though you know only in japan maybe well, indies, indies started to be a thing that attracted some attention yeah, in the right. late 80s. Yeah. And, uh, and so, the, again, the major labels uh, following music magazines decided that maybe they better look uh, for some artists that they didn't develop themselves. Okay. And uh, so there are a lot of fake indies at that time, people who looked like an independent kind of band, but they were they were always connected with a major label. So, That's interesting. and this, you know, and this also, you know, if you look at American or British indie labels, most of them were able to arrange uh, distribution through a, a major distributor. Right. And that really wasn't true in the early days of Japanese indies. So they could only, and so, Hirokawa Shin, from, uh, who was from Jujia Records and Zero mm -hmm. Records, uh, he set up an early distributor for independent records, real independent records. Mm -hmm. And they sold almost exclusively at uh, import shops. Right. So like where I said Jujia had a bin of a 30 or 40 Japanese indies, other in, uh, import shops, would also have about that much. And uh, and that was basically something that he did. Wow. So he was a good wow. he was a good guy. It's only I mean, five foot two. <laughs> I mean even <laughs> now unless like, the, unless the time has really come. Good, but even now like Japan doesn't really have a good like distribution. There's no like big like good indie distributors really. It's never kind of took off here. It's nasty. Mm. Yeah. Uh in in the 80s, there was a boom of something that was called cassette books. Okay. And um, <clears throat> this was a cassette and a book packaged together. Mm -hmm. And the reason for this was that the, I, the idea for, the, for this was that bookstores right. were much more open to stocking mm -hmm. minor publishers than record stores were open to stocking minor mm -hmm. uh, labels. And... Uh, and so that there are some really interesting things. Children coup d'etat from uh, yeah. Kyoto had a cassette book. And uh, even Sakamoto Ryuichi had a cassette book. And wow. a, lo a lot of other people. EP4. Mm. I don't know if you know about EP4. Mm. Another Kyoto band. Pro pro possibly not exactly in your line of uh, musical expertise. <laughs> but uh, huh. much more of a dance band. Okay. But uh, they they had uh, 
um, cassette book and so on. So, wow. but uh, obviously there's a there's a limit to that because you yeah. have to get it reviewed and, you, yeah. and the, the bands have to go out and play. But that was one way to try to get um, musical product into the hands of people who were not living in a big city where they could see the shows. Right. Um, I don't know why that disappeared. It was a pretty good idea, but yeah. well, I, I don't think I, I, I didn't bring any. David, I, I know you've got like a bit of a, a box of records that are important to you. Shall we have a look at some of them? All right. So <laughs> what, what do we what do we save for for? All right, here's an early uh, Alchemy yeah. record. Oh yes, Ultra B Day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've never actually seen and, that. Yeah. And this this was also a, quite a shock to me whenever I heard this because B Day had already gone to America right. at that time. Yeah. And but I knew who he was mm. and that he was important before he joked Kaida. Mm. And this uh, was a kind of punk that I had never heard. I think if you want to compare it to something, it's like the first Public Image Limited. Okay, yeah, a little bit, yeah. Mm. And it's chaotic. It's yeah. chaotic, and obviously much of it is improvised, mm. but still has a strong sense of punk. Yes, yeah. But I think, but I think it's older than <laughs> Public Image Limited. <laughs> They're a great band, very unique, incredible band. I saw them really late in the game in up in the Osaka outside a festival and they they were still incredible i mean just even 10 years ago absolutely amazing uh he's a really interesting guy yeah and uh you can uh, read about him in my book <laughs> <laughs> well, nice segue <laughs> yeah rumors of noise rumors of noise uh which is about the beginnings of the the noise uh, subculture amazing. um He's kind of a hikikomori. Yeah. You want to explain yeah. to your listeners uh, what he hikikomori is? Well, yeah, he doesn't come out of the house much, I, I hear. But he was doing like yeah. little shows at his house for a while, in his parents' house, yeah. I think, doing little sh shows there at his yeah. house in Kyoto. Yeah. Yeah. But I haven't heard from him in a little while. Not, not sure how he's doing. He, he had uh, a recording studio built in there, too. Okay. But I don't think he's doing anything now. And uh, mm. I don't know if his parents are still alive. I but, mean, you know. uh, but so, yeah, he's sort of uh, missing in action. Yeah. And here's a really rare record. Oh, I saw that for sale the other day for an insane amount of money. <laughs> don't like, care like 200,000 or so? Something like that. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, this is that's. Oh. Inu, Inu is on there and mm. Ultra B Day. And, yep. um, and there's a group called Chinese Club, which is the post SS before Continental Kids. Okay. I meant to ask you about SS when we started off about the, the Japanese punk stuff. SS, were... I, I, never, I, never, I never saw SS live. Right. But I, I still have a connection with uh, the bass player from SS. And, Damn. Um, uh, they insist. I, I, I interviewed Shino Yan for another another book, mm. and uh, talking to Takeno, who's a bass player, and they insist that um, SS was not a punk band at all. SS was a pop band. Really? Like some people have even that's, said that that's like the first hardcore punk record like ever. <laughs> people say that, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh. and it's it's hard to hear that it's not punk mm. <laughs> it is yeah. and uh. and they were inspired by the ramones yeah but but they insist that they're inspired by the pop aspect of the ramones okay so mm. uh, they just wanted to play fast yeah they did um and ah. they were they were a bunch of high school they were a bunch of high school kids right or just out of high school um in fact, all of those people were really young mm. in the late 70s scene. So, so who, from his, SS, his, who from SS went into Continental Kids? 
Only Shinoyan, I think. Okay. Okay. Um. Oh no, Isono. Okay. The drummer. All right. Isono and Shinoyan both went on, and of course, uh, Continental Kids. Uh, if, I'm sure you've seen their records. They dress like the Rolling Stones. Oh, <laughs> I, I love. I, I, that's a kind of strange band, like because they have some really amazing songs on the records, and some like not so good. But visually, that the records look amazing. I think you know with the mask and all this, and of course, um, and this is, and this is one of the first ones I saw live in wow. Japan in like 82, 83. And they were fantastic live. Can imagine, yeah. And part of it, I, I'm not sure how much I want to confess to this, but uh, the bass player, Ranko. I was going yeah, to ask you about Ranko, yeah. Mm. Um, she showed her nipples <laughs> <laughs> on stage. Did you ever see S Sperma as well? Yes, sure, yeah. yeah. Uh, not, as, not as good, much, much more metallic. Yeah. And... Yeah. Um, and some, somehow or other, it lacked the kind of uh, okay. tension okay. that uh, co Continental Kids had. Right. But the amazing thing to me was that um, after the show, this is, you know, this is Kansai, mm. and they're playing in places that really don't have a dressing room. <laughs> She's in her stage costume with, with her nipples showing. Uh -huh. And after the show, you can go say, it's a great show, and she'll stand there and talk to you <laughs> without, <laughs> without any uh -huh. self-consciousness at all. Oh, amazing. She <clears throat> passed away, right? From cancer. Yep. Um, cancer. Yep. She, quite young. Quite young, yeah. But yeah. Really important back. There was a, there was, um, I'm, I'm, I don't, I know some of the people that are involved in it, but the Seibu Kodo mm. is a hall at the western edge of Kyoto University campus. Right. And a bunch of people were living in there. Wow. And and she was part of that scene. Okay. And and those people were politically radical mm. and um, a post post hippie. It's it's difficult. Generally, we think of a, a, a punks being anti hippie, mm. but I think in Japan there's a kind of continuum from the anti social activities yeah. of hippies to yeah. to the anti social activities of punks. I agree absolutely. All the nightmare guys were really into kind of like the hippie stuff and they, were, they didn't see a difference really actually right and this is why there could be psychedelic music and punk uh, cooperating there you go because didn't like guys from like subvert blaze and all those kind of bands like there was a crossover with dance macabre and all that all those guys yes like yes they were, they were all friends yeah 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 i yeah. think that's what's cool about cancer there was more you know what unity for want of a better word between bands maybe at least less rivalry. Less rivalry. So that, that, it changed a bit actually later on, but that was like within the hardcore scene, like different styles of hardcore. That kind of post yeah. part, actually, but uh, that's another story. But, uh, yeah, I'm not sure if I want to go all the way to unity, but at least yeah. less rivalry. Less yeah. rivalry is a good, yeah, good way of putting it. Yeah. David, can I ask um, you about a couple of more bands that you put out a little bit? Do you mind? Public, sure. Public Bath. Yeah. Garlic Boys, you've got to talk about the Garlic Boys a little bit. I think you have the honor of putting out the best Garlic Boys record by far. Like Yokozuna, it's, I mean, I you know, listened to it the other day and it's still a classic. How did you get to work with the Garlic Boys? And tell me about it. Well, about again, I, I, again, I was just, just hanging out and yeah. this this is a great live band and, and friendly guys. And yeah. I said, I want to do it. And they definitely wanted to do it because yeah. they unusually uh in japan they listen to a lot of american hardcore okay yeah almost all japanese punk bands were british right? totally british yeah that's right and the garlic boys were very much like a california band if you think about it yeah and yeah. including including some funny punk aspects like circle funny jokes punk. And, yeah 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 and uh so, like, the, their alchemy record, King of Smell. That's it. <laughs> I mean, that one, a Niniku Night is another one. I don't know if that was on alchemy or not, but <laughs> Garlic yeah, Night. Right. <laughs> no, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> King of Smell. I Want Your Panty was another one of their songs. I remember. <laughs> yes. <laughs> classy, classy stuff. But, like, Yokozuna is, I don't know, it's just a classic. I just, I don't think they ever topped that song, you know, throughout their whole career. 
Uh, you, you may be right. Yeah. Yeah. Just but they were they were just fun, and they really yeah. wanted to do something. Yeah. And they asked me if I could arrange an American tour for them, Ooh. but I, I, I really wasn't set up to do that. So. Right. But you did. So it would have been Zeni, fun. You did bring Zenny Giva to America, right? Yes. Yeah. Whenever we, whenever Public Bath put out a Zenny Giva uh, CD, we toured about 15 American cities. So, and I, I did all the driving. Oh man. So, you know that I kind of went in and out of Japanese music for a while. You know, as as like as you go through life, you kind of lose interest at some points. And I've sold records, but that band is one that since I discovered them, I mean, I'd never tire of them. All their records are just incre absolutely incredible, incredible band. Yeah, very, very, very powerful stuff. Very powerful, yeah. And um, a, I first became aware of KK Null because of YBO Squared. Mm, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, there are many different ways to say the name of this band. I would Most call people say too. what? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. But actually, the original name was Ibo Ibo. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. And Ibo Ibo means warts. Oh, <laughs> and this was a kind of super group mm. with uh, Yoshida Tatsuya from mm. Ruins on drums and KK Null on guitar and vocals right. and Kitamura Masashi on bass. And Kitamura Masashi was the editor of Fool's Mate magazine. Okay. So they had great publicity. Right. I mean, any, anything that YBO2 did was um, in Fool's Mate magazine the next month. And this group was incredibly powerful on stage. Mm -hmm. They didn't come down to Kansai very often. Okay. And when they, when they did, it would, it would be like a tour of the arts universities. Mm -hmm. And uh, and they were they were <clears throat> Momoyama Gakuen Gakuin University had a, an all night concert every year in the school festival season, and maybe that's maybe that's where I first saw YBO too. But they, they even had major bands like the Roosters at wow. the Momoyama, wow. and uh, and Jagatara and uh, oh. yeah. um. Anyway, that's where I first saw YBO mm. too. And then the next time I think I saw KK Null, it was a solo performance at mm. Bears. Oh. And, and he put the guitar on a table and sticking rods and things through the guitar. And uh, it was a, a brilliant noise, free jazz mm. performance. And I knew about Zenigeva, of course, by this time, but I had never seen Zenigeva mm. live. And I asked him, do you want to put something out on Public Bath Records? And uh, he said, yeah. So, right. so we went, I, I contacted Steve Albini and uh, we went to Chicago and uh, recorded in Steve Albini's basement. And, and um, Beautiful. Steve, Steve, Steve is still a friend. So. Cool, because you put out the big black pig pile. Pig, what you put out? Pig pile, yeah. Yeah, pig pile, yeah, yeah. On the your other label, yeah. Cento, right? Cento, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you want one? I'd love you one. Want it, it, it's <laughs> actually, it's actually possibly the one of the rarest big black records. I was looking into it a little bit actually. Yeah. Only five hundred of them made. Yeah. yeah, it's light. It's a light light it, in England, right? Somewhere in England, is that right? Yeah, I think yeah. so. And the um, the the sound that's included on the CD is exactly the same as the one every, every place else, but the, right. the jacket design, the CD design is different. So there, there are only 500 of those. I'll give you one next time I see wow. it. So. <laughs> Beautiful. Oh, man. So, it, I, man, I, so many I still have, a, I still have about, a, I have about a hundred of them. <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> what? David, I've got to ask you about the, uh, the music for psychological liberation as well on Kansai TV. <laughs> good memories of that? Yeah, yeah. very good. Just tell everyone about, about that. What was, what was it all about? Um, all right, what you need to know about is that mm. um, Marukabatsu Record Store 
was doing a series of um, videos called Maru Kabatsu. Right. And, and these videos were introducing, uh, especially Kansai uh, artists, again, psychedelic and punk yeah. and noise. Mm. <clears throat> and I was good friends because I went to their record store every week also. Still go there. With the guys run, the guys running uh, Maru Kabatsu. And right. by this time, I could speak Japanese pretty well. Mm. I'd been in Japan about 10 years by this time. And uh, they asked me to, to be a host for videos, mm. thinking that would be cool. And actually, there, was, there were a bunch of really cool uh, conversations <laughs> that never made it onto the Maru oh, Kabatsu yeah? tapes. Like what? Um, you know, just <laughs> no, 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 just well, there actually there were some things caught on tape okay, okay. <laughs> that we wouldn't want to talk about. Okay, but um, um, basically sitting around mm -hmm. doing the, the sound tests. What are we going to talk about tonight? And sometimes uh, what we talked about in those the sound checks was more interesting than what actually ended up on the tapes. Wow. Um, uh, personally, I'm not a very shy person, no. so I can I, I can talk. So uh, who, what bands did you talk talk to or talk with on those on those videos, David? Do you remember? Well, we talked to Yamatsuka okay. and um, I, um, I talked to Jojo and. Yep. Um, well, quite quite a lot, I think. Let's click on YouTube, hard. right? I think you can see it on YouTube. And um, the whole of I don't know, psychological I, liberation is on YouTube. I think the whole thing. Perhaps. It comes and goes. Okay. Okay. I think I think think that there are some parts of it that are problematic from a copyright standpoint, and it, and it gets taken down. So let's. What but, was music psychological liberation? It was on Kansai TV. It was like a documentary. TV. So, so a, a guy who was working for Kansai TV mm. had seen the Maru Kabatsu mm. uh, videos, and he wanted to do something like that right. on late night Kansai TV. And uh, so he contacted the alchemy people and the Maru Kabatsu people and the the usual suspects okay. and um, and set up this thing. And there were one or two people who made it into the television program who actually were not part of the Kansai Underground. Right. And those those were people who had sponsors. Oh. Who we so there was a, a there was a girl group called the Nelleries. Mm. Who I think I think they used an accordion and they, they kind of they kind of sounded like uh, uh, the Mumford and Sons or kind of uh, <laughs> British British folk influenced uh, rock music, some, something like that. Mm. Nelleries, and Nelleries. they had major label backing, so okay. that they were we were able to get money from their company right. to help make the program. Gotcha. And maybe there's one more. I, I'm, mm. I'm not mm -hmm. sure, but um, basically, it was collecting a bunch of videos and putting them together. Right. And Alice Alice Sailor. Mm. Uh, from I forget I don't, the name of the band. Amaryllis. Amaryllis. Oh, yeah, we oh, don't. Um, we don't need to know her real name, do we? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm <laughs> <laughs> she has a bar now in Uji. Really? Yes. Wow. Let's go. After all this is over. <laughs> not tonight. I, I never go. <laughs> I'm, I'm never anywhere near Uji, so I've Kinda never far, been right? to her bar. Kinda way far north. Yeah. 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 Uh, anyway, so yeah. Alice Saylor and I sat at a studio in uh, Kansai Television one afternoon and recorded all the bits wow. in between the, the videos and and talked. And I have terrible long hair and a <laughs> mustache. And uh, what? I, I, I don't know. I don't, Three, 1994, something like that. 92, 93, something like yeah. that, yeah. Wow. And so who actually ended up appearing like on Kansai TV on that day? Uh, 
Well, none one. of it's live. None of it's okay. Okay. So it's not like a documentary. None of it's something. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And uh, Higashito-san from uh, um, Forever uh -huh. Records in Osaka mm -hmm. was also responsible for arranging a bunch of uh, videos. Cool. I think I think the noise videos included on there mostly were supplied by him. Wow. And I think we'll get Incapacitance and mm -hmm. Mertzbau. Mm -hmm. I don't I don't know if there's Mertzbau on there or not. But, uh, um. But actually, I would say that if you want to see a, a good documentary of a Kansai scene, the, the uh, Marukabatsu tape about noise okay. is, is, is excellent. Wow. Is that and, the like these Omoro, Omoro series? Is that yes, yeah, Omoro, 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 that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. The, back Omoro to the, no, the, the Omoro noise tape is, is the best one. Okay, okay. And be, because we met at... I don't know why it was decided to do this, but we met at Umeda Station at like 11 o'clock at night. Yeah. And we were going to walk out to the place where there was a, a whole street where all these people with their remodeled cars and low riders and mm. so on were playing their sound systems and so on. And we were going to start there is the, the noise of the streets of Osaka. Uh. And we started to talk and about 10 seconds later, a fire truck went by, <laughs> which, uh, of course, was not planned. But yeah, yeah, even yeah. big, e even bigger noise than the, the low riders. So, yeah. David, I've got so many things I want to talk to you about. So I, I think we've got to do a part two if you don't mind spending another hour with me at some point in the near future. Sure, of course, love to. Yep, so much fun. So many good stories, so many things I didn't know about. And I'm still <laughs> jealous that you went to eggplant. It's a car park now, right? I think. No, it's no. a it's a hospital now. Is it really? Is it? Okay. It was a car it was a car park for a long time, but now it's a hospital. Okay. That's a, a step up at least. <laughs> <laughs> the car park, yeah. Yeah, well, but we can't we can't go there. Uh, at least I hope we don't go there. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to be going there anywhere anyway. Anyway, anytime <laughs> soon. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thanks, David. Let's do it's a closing. Great campai. to talk to you. Come by. Cheers. Cheers. Okay. Thanks, everybody. I hope you enjoyed this as much as I enjoyed it. Yeah. I had a great time. So thanks. Great David. to talk to you, Mike. Thanks, David. Until next and, time. And, I, and, I, and I hope we'll be able to see each other at shows again in Maybe the near Mikami future. Kan. We didn't talk about Mikami Khan. Next time we'll talk about Mikami Khan a little bit. Interesting guy. Very interesting guy. So everybody look forward to that. Until next time. Stay healthy. Okay. And stay. Thanks very much. Clean.